Hello, my name is David Ades. I'm a poet based in Sydney and the host of a monthly, monthly poetry reading series and now podcast series called Poets Corner, which is presented in association with West Words, which is in Parramatta in Sydney's West. West Words is Western Sydney's literature development organisation. Poets Corner is part of West Words public programming that celebrates the richness, diversity and insight that literature offers. Especially in these times, we thank the ongoing support of Create New South Wales, the Cultural Fund of Copyright Australia, City of Parramatta Council, Blacktown City Council and Campbelltown City Council, as well as the many project partners that have enabled us to continue to provide opportunities to writers and audiences. We hope that this new world will see a sharing and a closeness of spirit. So each month I invite a poet to read poems and talk about them for an hour or so on a theme of the poet's choice. Our invited guest today is Damon O'Brien, who will read poems and talk on the theme of the end of things. But before we start, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. I'm recording this from Beecroft in Sydney. Damon is recording from the Moreton Bay area in southeastern Queensland near Brisbane. I would like to pay my respects to and acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of the Wallamita people, the traditional custodians of the land in Beecroft, and also of the Kwandamuka people, the traditional custodians of the land in Southeast Queensland and the Moreton Bay area, and to acknowledge also that they are the sovereign owners of their land, which has never been ceded or given up. Damon. Damon O'Brien is a multi-award winning Brisbane poet. In 2021, and, and we're only in April, Damon has won the Cafe Writers Poetry Competition, the Magma Judges Prize, the MPU International Poetry Competition, and received second place in the Gregory O'Donoghue Poetry Competition. Damon has been published in New Millennium Writings, the Atlanta Review, the Mississippi Review, Cordite, Southerly, Stylus Lit, and many other journals. Damon has been lucky enough to win some of Australia and the world's most prestigious poetry prizes for a single poem, including the Moth Poetry Prize, the Newcastle Poetry Prize, and the Peter Porter Poetry Prize. Damon's first book of poetry, Animals with Human Voices, is forthcoming in September with recent work press and is available now for pre-order. Damon keeps toying with moving to the United Kingdom since it seems to like his poetry so much. Well, we do too, Damon. His wife and children think he is crazy. You can find him on www.damono.org. Hi, Damon, and welcome to Poets Corner. Hi, David. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, you've chosen the end of things. This is a very sort of apocalyptic type of theme as your theme this, this, uh, this month. Um, there is a sense of the apocalyptic in your work, throughout your work, and, and so many of the poems are concerned with endings. Reading your work, um, I was struck by the pervasiveness of the theme in it. And, uh, and I, it made me wonder, is, is this theme more than a theme to you and something of a personal existential issue for you? Um, I don't know it's existential. Um, I actually have a theory um, that uh, all poets are writing either about the endings or the beginnings of things. Uh, I, think, I think as poets... Uh, it's we we like to write about the edge, uh, the the moment where something changes from one thing to another. And uh, um, for me, uh, beginnings uh, is isn't really my bag. Uh, that seems too positive. Um, I've never been a positive poet. Um, whereas uh, the end of things, uh, you know, has those connotations of of. Uh, of negative uh, emotions and uh, and uh, I think that's that's where I sit quite nicely uh, as a poet. But uh, um, as a as a personal um, uh, philosophy or, or journey, I, I don't think it, I don't think that's that's the connection at all. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm not one of those poets that writes out of uh, a, a background of of real um, uh, pain or, or suffering in my own life. I've, I've had a very lucky life. Um, and not much death or, or endings uh, in it. So um, I just think it's that easy groove that, uh, you know, allows you to start thinking philosophically about the universe. Um, you know, um, what is left? You know, what, what um, after things end? Uh, what, what is the legacy that, uh, that remains? 
Um, and uh, and I think that's why it, uh, it, 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 you can find it in my poetry. Um, after we chose the theme, um, I started finding it everywhere. So I'm not surprised you, you noticed it in, the, in, in all my poems. Yeah, no, I found it everywhere too. And actually you, you've preempted my, my, my next question because I was going to ask you about, about beginnings. And I was also, also going to ask you about, you know, whether there was a sense of ennui or despair or if it's more really a kind of inquiry and interrogation of the subject. Yeah, yeah, I, th there is a level of despair. And I, I think um, uh, particularly over the last few years, I've focused very much on it. Um, and that's probably because in some ways we're all living in a, in a kind of end times or it feels that way. Um, uh, you know, we're living in, the, in, in one of the great extinction events of, of, of history. And it's very hard not to feel like everything is ending. Uh, you know, the news is, is constantly telling us of the, uh, uh, the destruction of the environment or, or the next uh, uh, extinction of, of some animal that, um, uh, and it's very difficult not to feel like, well, you know, there's nothing we can do. And, and you know, there's that, that kind of moment of, uh, of you know, grief, uh, that I think that we're all kind of suffering a little bit, uh, which maybe was even more um, uh, focused upon us with uh, the events of COVID-19. Um, you know, we, we, we feel like uh, our lifestyle, our, 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 the way we, we've lived is, is kind of ending um, and, and we're not sure what's coming next. So I think that's, I think a lot of our poetry comes from that. Mm. But it begs the question, I suppose, where do you go from here? <laughs> if, you're, if you're preoccupied with endings, um, you know, you've got a book coming out, which, you know, is very exciting. Um, but then, you know, after that, sometime after that, there's going to be another book. Um, so that book, that book is the beginning in a way. So where do you go from here is, I suppose, the question. Well, we, I don't know. We could go darker, I, I guess. Um, uh, the, there is a question being asked when, whenever you, you look at the end of things, right? Well, what does come next? And uh, poetry is all about asking those questions. Um, I, I'm still looking for the answer, David. So, um, uh, and I think, I think the, the great thing about a question like that is you can keep um, digging into it and, and you kind of never get to the end. Um, if, if we knew the answer, then... Uh, it wouldn't be such a great fascination for so many poets. Um, uh, so uh, I think I've got a little way to go in, uh, in plumbing those particular depths. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I, I do admire the poets that can write um, positively of, of, of newness and growth. And uh, I, I'm always testing and trying to write that poetry, um, but, but not particularly succeeding. So uh, um, you may, you will see something in, the, in a future book, perhaps. Okay, look forward to that. Let's read some poetry. Sure. Um, I'll read you Carpool. Um, Carpool is, is actually forthcoming in uh, Australian Book Review. Um, I'll talk to you about it in a minute. Carpool. Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. The rain blew you into the back seat, steaming and boisterous. My quiet son, and you, he's not friend, Dad. We only share some classes. Or late evenings, sunset dampening down the final lap around the oval, falling into the back seat, grass stained and sweaty, for a grunt or two about school and other tyrannies. And then we'd have the radio on for the trip to your house or my one-sided conversation about the world's events, things I had heard. My son would roll his eyes and open a book, and you would thank me politely at the door of your dark house. Today, I heard about the caverns under the Nullarbor, plinking cisterns and subway stations gobleted with water, kilometres of tunnels small as a wriggle or large as a castle. All the light the dark keeps to itself, is caught in those limestone funnels. Avers fly through water, lucid as a dream, cold as truth. 
their torchlight repeats, redoubles, pure and clear, through copepod and brachypod, through the blind flutter of slippery fish. None have ever met a man. Blowing lace of slime, fragile spiders, all waiting for you. Kilometres of undiscovered worlds beneath the desert, all waiting for you. The fingers of a hand, and in a lifetime, only a thumb might get explored, each caver going further than the last. You could be whatever you wanted to be. You could swim forever in these bowls buried deep beneath the sounding holes and roaring seeps, beneath the huddled salt bush, the wheeling telltale birds. You could swim forever and never need a breath. One tank could last forever. Whatever troubled you would be years away from the man you would become. Whatever you never spoke about to me on that 15 minute trip to your house would be forgotten pain. Down each pointing finger in the rock held out for you, if you could wait that long. But I won't drop you off anymore. Your father met me where the parents wait, his eyes as old as caves, and spoke of your depression. All I can think about is waste of fingers down beneath the heavy dust closing into stony fists. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'll talk to you and look back, but you'll be gone, and those whistling bats and all that lightless light must wait for someone else to find them. I look back through my rearview mirror at a queue of parents in their idling cars, at a recursive hall of mirrors, at my son, and at the missing boy next to him, and all those fathers look back in their rearview mirrors, at the shape of what the future might become, what the future can no longer become. I think we could spend the whole hour talking about that poem, but I'll, I'll try and, and not. Um, one of the things that I, I feel fascinated about with every poet, um, we're, we're told that the I in the poem is not necessarily the poet. Um, so I'm often wondering at that sort of junction between imagination and reality in a poem, uh, whether or not any of the, the poem actually occurred or whether it's something that you've, you've come up with. Sure. Um, to be honest, this is probably one of my more, most honest poems or it feels honest. Now this didn't happen to me, um, but um, the, there was a, a moment last year um, at my my boys' school, where there were a number of number of really young boys took their own lives in a in a short uh, space of time, um, and it it, it it affected me. Uh, you can probably tell my voice it's, it's affecting me now, um, probably because I had I've got children of my own, and uh, and and that this poem came out of that. Um, uh, there's a line in there uh, about waste. Mm. And uh, um, that, I think that's really the, the pivot line for the poem for me because that's, that, that, that's how it felt about these, these young kids that uh, have so much time ahead of them, uh, so much potential. Uh, you, know, you, you know, think, in that, uh, think of that, that concept of, of you start out with an infinite list of possibilities in your life and as you go you kind of snip those off one by one and uh, you know as, as you get older when, when you're so young you know that you, you still got so many possibilities and, and it just really it really bothered me and I, I could imagine being that that father um uh, and being the being the father of that son who, who uh who took their own life so um it, 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 is a pers it is a more personal poem than many of my poems. Mm. I've mentioned to you before that um, one of the things that I like about your poetry is that it, it has a kind of labyrinthine quality. Uh, it takes me places where I don't expect it to go. Um, so I'm always uh, a little bit unsure of where the poem is going and there's lots of surprises in your work. Um, I mean, this poem opens with an ordinary 
urban scenario, if you like. And then all of a sudden, and I'm not sure quite how you managed to do it. We're under the caves in the Nullarbor with cavers and, and that world. And then you come back, you come back to the urban scenario, which is anything but normal. Um, so there, there has been a, a real transformation during the course of the, of the poem. There's a doubling back, looking, looking forwards and looking back. And it seems to me uh, a very conscious thing um, because you actually refer to it when you talk about the, the uh, recursive hall of mirrors um, where things are seen multiple times in a receding way. Um, so the question I suppose is, is this a very deliberate sort of ploy, a poetic device, or is this just the way that your mind works? I think the latter. Um, I actually wrote this in the car, in the queue, waiting for my boys, listening to a, uh, a radio program about um, cave diving. And, uh, and, and um, it was one of those few poems that, uh, you know, it just kind of jumps, jumps out at you straight away. Um, I only had about 15 minutes before the, the, the three o'clock bell was, was ringing and I was looking for, for the boys and, um, and the news about uh, these, these other boys was, was not that old. Um, and so it all kind of connected. Um, I, I, you are right, though. It is probably a motif in, in my poetry. I do like to start with the, the, uh, the ordinary um, uh, and the everyday. Uh, if I'm going to talk about a big, a big issue, I, I do like to talk, like to begin from the the, the small detail and work my way upwards from there. Um, you, you've got to bite that elephant off uh, uh, one bite at a time, and, and I feel like if you if you start with those great big concepts, um, uh, you can lose your audience very quickly. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's not meaningful to people unless you, you bring it back to that, that small common connection. So um, that, that story arc, that narrative arc, I think is an important part of um, the poems I try and write. Yeah. <clears throat> so you ground the poem in the detail and you, you, you go from there. You mentioned um, possibilities. And I just wondered um, a little bit about how you conceive of the possibilities you know, as it relates to you as a writer, as a person, um, diminishing over time. But, you know, you start off with all these possibilities. And um, in a way, this poem is self-reflective, I think. And so you, you, you're investigating your own possibilities too, aren't you? I think you probably uh, caught me out on something there. So um, the other element, I, I guess, with, with things ending is, and I might have mentioned it earlier, is, is this concept of, of legacy, of, you know, of what you leave behind. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think, I think as, as poets, that's part of what we, we, we worry about all the time. You know, have we, have we written something that's, that's meaningful and, and worthy and worthwhile and, and something that, uh, um, you know, could be left behind and, and sums, your, sums your life up? Um, so there is a thread of that. Um, I, I, I'm, I would love to, to be the, a poet that would one day um, have a, you know, be quoted, uh, have a line that, that, that lives inside someone else's head because that means, uh, you know, I've left a legacy. Um, we don't, uh, when things end, we don't have much um, other than the, uh, the, the tangible works um, to, to show for everything we've done. And, and even that's a very very transitory thing. So, uh, yeah, you've caught me here. It's, uh, it's certainly something that uh, I do come back to uh, that is hidden in my poetry. It reminds me of that wonderful W.S. Merwin poem. Um, I think it's called Epitaph. I think it goes, who should I send it to? And that's the poem. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to read us another one? Um, sure. Uh, a little bit of a change of pace. Um, I'll read The Grasshopper's Legacy. <clears throat> After all, it wasn't we who failed the earth. The earth failed us. We were busy following our madmen into a kind of sanity. We were busy taking their money to look away. 
then Yellowstone blue on the dandelion of this rusty planet, and we are no longer busy. My two wild sons, who will not grow to be men, laugh outside, stick out their tongues under the fluffing ash, assay crude snowmen. My wife stands at the doorway stiff with worry, but she needn't call them in. There is no time left to do things differently. The sky is black with the volcano's breath, and whatever we have planted in those fields, whatever we have planted in our children, whatever we have planted in our cities, in our clever books and plans and works will have to be enough. We were not ready. It is cold and it will grow colder. Yes. That initially brought to mind the, the movie 2012 where Yellowstone goes up. And uh, uh, I haven't seen that actually. <laughs> yeah, check it out. It's good for the special effects. Um, I was just wondering about the title of this poem. Can you tell me a bit about what that has? Grasshopper's Legacy. Um, it's the old fable. Um, you know, the, that, uh, and, and I'm going to get this wrong now, but, uh, you know, the, the, the ant, I think it's the ant is, works busily, it's industrious, it prepares for uh, um, the hard times and, uh, and the grasshopper um, is the opposite. It kind of lives, it's uh, the gadfly, it does it um, from day to day and it doesn't really care about the future. And uh, when, when, uh, when the hard times come, um, it's not ready, and it, and it you know it seeks that kind of protection from uh, um, uh, from the from the ant. You know, give me some of your food. I, I, I need to, to live. I need to survive. Have I got that right, or have I got? Have I, have I... Well, I don't know. I don't didn't know the fable. I know the movie ants, and, and I know the grasshoppers in the movie ants. So um, yeah, thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, um, okay. I, I, one of the one of the um, wonderful mysteries of poetry for me is uh, the genesis of poems, you know, how they come to be written, where they, where they come from. I love the story that the late American poet Ruth Stone had that she, she seemed to think that these poems were just out there flying around through the ether, ether and she had to be attentive to catch them. And if she, if she didn't catch it, mm. another poet would catch it and write the poem. I don't think it's quite like that, but I was just wondering what prompted this poem. Um. Well, it wasn't 2012, it wasn't the movie, um, but uh, I think I was actually reading um, a series of books by uh, um, uh, Terry Pratchett and... Um, uh, Long Earth. Long Earth. You, yeah. you know the series? I know the series. Um, where they were talking about that as a, as a potential uh, doomsday event. Um, and, and a lot of people don't know that um, uh, Yellowstone um, is... Is essentially sitting on a big, uh, big volcanic um, um, uh, area that could c go up at any time. Uh, they, they, you know, it's it's due to go up, and if it does, um, then the world is as we know it is gone, um, and there's nothing you can do about it. So um, we we worry constantly about these these environmental um, uh, things that. There's lots we can do about. Um, we we also worry about these you know these meteors from space or you know wh whichever whichever is our, our current Armageddon of choice. Um, but there's one there that uh, no matter what we plan for, um, you know it may end us. Uh, well, it segues uh, into my next question because um, the first line, after all, it wasn't we who failed the Earth. Um, uh, I was wondering whether that was a kind of um, wishful thinking on your part that you know, we needn't feel too guilty about what we're doing to the planet, planet because uh, it's going to do it to us anyway. Oh, uh, look, uh, it comes out of that that uh, that that despair. Look, the first three or four lines, they're, they're all a dig. Um, uh, if, if you read them the right way, they're all a dig at our, at our politicians. Um, you know, busy following our manment into a kind of sanity, um, busy taking their money to look away. Yeah. Uh, it, it does feel like many of our um, our conversations are about how expensive it is to to do the right thing for for the planet. Um, so it's a, it's a dichotomy between uh, the between having um, a good lifestyle and having uh, money um, and uh, saving saving the world. 
Um, so that's that's probably what's uh, what's hidden in there. Um, I, I don't want that to be the answer, David. Um, so yeah, it's not my it's not my secret wish. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's it it's it is. Uh, you know, it is difficult to not feel like um, we're never going to get there lately. Well, let's get to another poll. Um, I'll read, actually, I'll read um, A Rainbow Made of Soil next. <clears throat> A rainbow made of soil. If I am lost, I have been lost since I was born. There are no gods for wombs. We are each alone. How would a god find me scratching in the dark? I am lost then, tinkering in the bitter rind of the earth. My roof thuds with the shambling footsteps of dumb animals who follow what they see. Clipped stars, the fumbling moon. That seems too harsh a path. Narrow choices, a terrible light. I am mostly soil nudging in the red throat of darkness, and the soil moves through me, making its blind promise, its digestive ethics. All my paths are innocent. I have written in the book of the earth, and left a Bible that no one shall ever die for. There is no evil in the earth. There is no striving. There is only the warm ruminations of roots and flexing shoulders of fungi. If I am lost, it is only that I have never needed to know my destination. When the pounding fingers of rain tap on the earth's scalp and the sod soaks to the brimful, and I rise, gasping to the spade's scooped surface. Nothing will save me from the flood. If every fleck and pith of soil I chew on is equal, each end is righteous. Oh, thank you. Um, I could never have written a poem like that. You, you channeled your inner worm. How did you do it? Um, it's kind of a poem on the Zen state of worms, really, isn't it? Um, we could do with a bit of Zen. We could do with a bit of less striving and and more kindness and. Yep. Uh, um, so, so this this poem is actually in in the book, um, uh, and I've re I'm reading a few of the poems uh, from the book. Um, I was going through a period where I was looking for voices um, that weren't my own voice, uh, um, places to step off into a, a different direction to kind of freshen up um, my writing. Um, the good thing about writing from the point of view of a worm is I know absolutely nothing about worms um, and I didn't bother to do any research about worms. A lot of people say that you should write from what you know. I don't believe that. Um, you can write from what you know, and that's fine. But uh, writing writing completely from a different experience is is, is fun, and I think um, often generates more interesting uh, poetry. Um, but uh, you know, I I like the the, the tabula rasa of a, of a worm that you know you can write any any kind of um, thought in it. And, uh, and I think that's actually part of this, the, the story of, the, of that poem is, it's, uh, is it, um, it's, it's so innocent. It's, it's before the fall, if you like. Uh, it, 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 doesn't, um, it, it doesn't need a God. Um, it, it doesn't need all those things that come with, uh, with, with striving, you know, um, the, the evils that come with striving. It's, it's innocent and, uh, and, and, and beautiful and it's making its own, own strange messages in, in the, the depths of, of the world. And the worm is, dare I say it, neglected in poetry. 
I mean, there's a million poems about birds. I think Mark Tredink likes to put a, po- a bird in, you know, as many poems as he possibly can. Mm-hmm. But how many poems are there about worms? Um, well, we'll probably look them up now and find <laughs> that there's heaps. Uh, I know there's heaps about snails, so uh, there you go. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, worms, are, worms, something that uh, it, you know. Again, it's a challenge. So, you know, it's nice to write about about uh, something that that no one else is writing about. Uh, um, I've written about uh, remoras, and I've written about uh, um, you know, crabs, and, and uh, this one's about worms. Yeah. Do you think there's a kind of parable in here? Um, the life we could lead if we could throw off our, what makes us human in a way. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, it, when we write a poem, we only ever write as humans, um, and and you know, hence the hence the title of of my uh, my book. Um, so so w- even when we throw throw off what what is to be human and try and write for like that, um, it, you know, it still comes out in the in the poem. It, it's a very human perspective on not writing as a human, but uh, um, it, it would be a it would be a very nice life for a very short period. <laughs> I think um, I think I think we're we're built for excitement. Um, uh, it is very hard to be be zen like. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think poets are very good at being Zen-like uh, in, in, our, in our poetry. Um, but it's nice to it's nice to imagine how the other half might live. Yeah, I mean, we have to have our sense of inquiry, and and uh, and poetry stems from that, and poetry goes there. Mm. Uh, it's one of the main functions of poetry is to inquire about the world, um, not just our own states of being, but everything around us. So thank you for that poem. What's next? Um, I'll read an inscription on a grave. Uh, this poem uh, recently won the uh, Mag- Magma Judges Prize. Um, an inscription on a grave. Driving past my favorite grave, headstone readable from the groaning road For the first time, I see that the flowers are gone. Neat little cemetery, new bedded plots, plump with raw soil, and my favourite grave in line with the lights. Every week, the flowers have changed. Mourner's almanac, artificial annuals, tizzy and cheerful, but missing today. I've been killing my parents for years, trialling my sadness, running simulations on the only disaster that can't be insured for, picking the scab. We do this in the tomb of our thoughts, fantasise our tragedies. I make a great orphan, a sympathetic bereaved. The funeral they have not had was well received, not a dry eye at the eulogy. This is healthy. But where are my favourite grave's flowers? Sprightly, thoughtful. That couple mouldering hand in hand beneath the cold granite aren't getting their weekly tribute of guilt and duty from the roadside vendor, and I am shaken. What can their children be up to? Have they closed on the auction outside the family pile, drained the champagne? Are they buying that super yacht with the tearful proceeds? Or are they holed up in traction, both legs in plaster, awkward gymnasts? frozen yoga instructors desperately trying to make their appointment and replace fading memories. I've been killing off my family for years. It's healthy, I hope, an inoculation against the virus of grief, getting the wreaths in early, ambassador-sized Jeroboam's of flowers, because I don't think that I can be that diligent, sweeping the ancestors' parcel the pressure to light a little candle to their memory. This grave has been a good reminder. First, there'll be a death, and then a grave with flowers tended for years. But the day will come when it will be impossible to get there, and other times, each harder still. And eventually, I won't come, and the flowers cool and drop, and the grave will become a shabby thing. And then... Long after my own eulogy, 
even the gravestone will be gone. This is a rubbing of the future. Better to let the weeds grow now. Better to scatter the ashes while you may. Better to wait for the green light and drive and drive. So yes, you, you, you ground this poem at the start with the detail. It starts off with a, a casual you know, drive-by observation. And then for me anyway, bang, I've been killing my parents for years. <laughs> it's like, as a reader, it's a kind of shot between the eyes. And it forces me to ask that uncomfortable question. Have I, have I been doing that? Mm. And in fact, this poem then goes into, for me, uh, a number of uncomfortable areas. Um, and they're uncomfortable because they're usually not articulated. Mm. We don't talk, there are some things we just don't get around to talking about. So one, that despite all our efforts to put down roots and solidify our, our lives and, 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 and be here, we're actually living lives of impermanence and you know they can be whisked off at any moment. Um, two, that separation from our loved ones really begins from the moment we meet them mm. and continues until it becomes permanent, whether through you know um, death or simply separation, um, estrangement. Difficult questions that um, that we we tend to try and avoid in our lives. But then I'm st I'm struck by the line, I'm struck by a few lines, obviously, but I'm struck by the line, we do this in the tomb of our thoughts, fantasize our tragedies, which to me is like a revelation of a secret that no one does talk about because I'm sure everyone does it, but who's ever said that they do it? Um, are, you are you motivated in your writing to interrogate the uncomfortable and the unspoken? Um, it is a confession of sorts that, uh, that, that, that this, this line, um, I want, I am trying to write as honestly as possible. Um, and I said earlier that that first poem is one of my most honest poems. Um, that line <clears throat> is one of my more honest lines, um, uh, you know, they, they, they say you should write fearlessly um, whenever you sit down to write, and that is, that is something I do try and do. Um, I, I'm not as confessional a poet as, as a lot of poets are. You know, I, I, don't, I don't write uh, the kind of Sharon Olds um, um, poetry about my own tragedy. Um, but uh, I, I, think, I think this is something that everyone does and doesn't say, um, you know, we 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 do struggle about uh, in in and worry about uh, our our the ones close to us, and we do wonder what that world would be like uh, without us. Um, you know, anyone uh, who's joked with their partner about uh, you know uh, at least at least if I die, you'll, you'll have to look after the kids. Um, you know, knows that there's a there's a there's a little little kernel of truth in that you know that uh, that, that they don't really want to say that we will talk about um, and uh, you know poetry is good for that right it's good for exploring those those dark edges um, you know that, that we don't really want to say uh, you know in in normal um, you know non metered uh, um, spoken word. So yeah, I guess a little bit, um, uh, but um, um, I I wrote this part because I realised I'd written a whole lot of poems where I, you know I killed my parents in the poem, uh, so so I thought I better hit that one head on. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, the poem's also a meditation on the moment that we're living in because we only ever live in a moment which is informed by the past and you know the past has claims on us and then there is the unknown future on the other side of it 
um, what you call the, I love the term, the rubbing of the future. At the end of the poem, you want to drive and drive and, and basically, if you like, run away from it all, but, but you can't, can you? Because the claims of the past are there and, and, and the claims of the future, unknown as they are, are there as well. Yep, yep. And you're right, it's, uh, it's the poet not dealing with the problem of the poem um, and, and simply driving on. Um, there, is a, there is a little bit of a solution in the, at the end there. You know, I'm, I am saying that, that maybe, maybe do it all now uh, while there is an opportunity to do it. Um, so that you don't have to, to face that, uh, that problematic future. Um, but, you know, we, we, we've been talking about this, that, uh, that that's the whole point of um, the end of things, isn't it? That, uh, you know, you can only reach a, a, a small way into, into that blackness and, uh, and, and work out what's over on the other side of that. So... You know, it's easy. It's much easier to uh, to leave things um, open and, and and unsolved, and mm. I guess dodge the dodge the question. Mm. Mm. Another poem. Um, sure. The immortal jellyfish. <laughs> Immortal jellyfish. I have pulsed through these blue Magellanic clouds of salt beyond the improbable past that made me. I have chimed with the deepest bells, mantled with my brothers. I am what I always was. I am older than the manta ray and megalodon, older than the weariest history of man. I've taken all the pathless currents of the sea, involuntary and empty, pushed and pulled where tide has taken me, drifted out of charts. The urchin with his spiny arms and mouthless mouth has taken the same road into these undying straits that I once took. Snib him down to a rag of meat. He'll grow new arms with time, but I have not learned my lesson, nor will he. The Highlander fighting through the mists of time the pearl beneath the sage's tongue, forgetting in the slow retreat of wisdom. I floated away from Gilgamesh's lesson. Eternity grants nothing to the living. I am the philosopher's scintillar of dust pinched into a man. Unravel me to the four corners of the earth. Scatter me to the wind. I will grow back no different than before. Each divisible and alone. I am and all of my parts am I. Peel me as bitter grape, chew me as old and indigestible gum, sift me through the filter of a whale. I am the original imprint of the sea, the matrix and the wafer for each tongue, the kernel and the seed of the ocean, its origin and its ending. Was it ambrosia I took once? Golden pear or apple which cursed me to this incarnation of the water. Memory shreds before the oceans ever drain. I have forgotten my purpose. I am an aimless agar agar, hoof of horse. Because I cannot die, I do not live. Immortality is not all it's cracked up to be, you reckon? That's it. That's it. We don't need to talk about the farm now. <laughs> And yet, you know, the jellyfish is like, uh, the jellyfish blooms everywhere at the moment. Yes. The, 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 the water's warming and they seem to be taken to it, loving it. Um, yeah, it's uh, eternity grants nothing to the living. Wow. I cannot die, I do not live. Because I cannot die, I do not live. Yeah. Um, it's this thing that, you know, there has been a quest, hasn't there, for longer lives, longer lives, longer lives. Um, and we know that with us, the, the quality dimish, diminishes you know, if, you, if you go on and on. Um, so the question I have is, have you written the immortal cockroach poem? Because they seem to be lasting even longer than jellyfish. Yep. 
Uh, well, that's actually in, in my book. Um, you, you'll see that in Measures of Truth, that there's a, there's a, a small uh, part to play for, for the cockroach uh, in that one. Uh, so, yes, I've written that one. <laughs> Um, is there anything, is there anything wistful about mortality for you? Um, wistful, it, it, it's, it's probably, you know, we talked about those things that we don't want to talk about, um, uh, in the last poem. And, and I, I think, I think again, deep down, everyone has a, has a little desire to live forever, don't they? Um, uh, I know you're a, a science fiction uh, lover, I am too, and and that the whole idea of uh, you know decanting your 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 mind, your 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 thoughts into a, a computer and getting the opportunity to, to live forever has a certain uh, a certain um, interest, shall we say? Um, uh, having said that, then the, you know, the question becomes: Well, okay, what would you do with it? Um, you know, ha have you got anything, uh, any purpose um, if you've lived for it? another 100 years, another 200 years, is anything going to be interesting um, after that time? So, um, you know, it, it, it is a bit of a lodestone, that thought, um, and everyone thinks at some point in their lives. Um, I, I, I admire uh, the people that, that, you know, come to the end of their lives and, and you know, they're, they're with a certain... Um, a sense of uh, you know that they've achieved something and that uh, you know let's let's move on to the next step. Um, I'm I'm not there yet, and uh, you know I'm still at the you know rage against the dying of the light stage, uh, and, and hopefully uh, it will be for a little while. So, yeah, you've got time. You've got time, Damon. You've got plenty. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Next poem. Um, uh, the careless shore. Now, this one was uh, uh, long listed for the uh, University of Canberra Vice Chancellor's Poetry Prize. That terrible indifference which expends itself on cold sand, on the caked calves of lifesavers, that boils its energies and in churning the sand, removing the marks of footprints, maple leaf seagull prints terminating into air. A child's question marks flung into the water. The following constellation of a dog's claws. So like the careless shifting in the dark gut of the universe, which takes a smut snowball of rock and ice and flings it at the earth, that brutal disregard of consequence. The lifesaver works for the hours of minutes at breath and pause while a silent gathers and the waves pound their apathy and erase the boy from the beach. Long after the world ends like a rock hurled out of an empty sky, the waves are still rewriting the pristine sand. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what you're trying to get at in this poem, actually. Um, uh, is this more about how we perceive than anything else? This poem, I guess, is, is it, again, it taps into that, um, that concern about what comes after that moment of, of death. Um, and almost immediately, uh, you know, the universe conspires to, to write you out of the record books. Um, you know, that almost immediately the... The, you know, you're, you're left in memories which are, which are naturally um, limited and, and will disappear and the people that know you will eventually pass on as well and, and what have you got left? You've got a, a blank slate where the waves have, have um, cleaned all those footprints that uh, you once placed on there. Um, so that's, that's where this, this, this poem is going. Um, I mean, you'll see that there's a, a nod to Armageddon in that one as well. Um, there's, a, there's a meteor um, um, yeah. uh, metaphor happening there. I can't help myself. Um, but, you know, that, that it's, it's about the, the universe doesn't care for us. Um, why, why should it? It doesn't conspire against us either. 
This is this is why I'm saying it's about perception. Sure. Why, why, we might want to be at the center of the universe. <laughs> that's that's a human ego thing. That's right. But, uh, it's it's not it's not a careless sure. The sure is not neither here nor there. It's, it, you can't attribute to a sure care or carelessness. Really, you can't attribute anything to the sure. It is what it is. It does what it does. It's 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 prevailed upon by the forces that prevail upon, it, and that's it. So we're anthropom anthropomorphizing the the universe and the shore and everything else. But at the end of the day, this is just our need for to be at the centre of it all, isn't it? Right. Right. Yep. To be the to be the the, the centre actor in our own play. Um, uh, and, and you're right. Um, the the universe doesn't care and shouldn't need to care. Um, uh, and it, you know the question becomes: Well, then. What are we in that big, uh, that big blank universe? What is what is our purpose? And that's that's the big question that we continue to ask in all these poems. What's all the striving for? Right. Yeah. Uh, well, we can postulate questions and answers about that. But uh, are you are you um, interested in philosophy? Is is, is there a philosophical underpinning to your work? Um, it is, but but only as an amateur. Um, uh, when I was uh, in high school, um, I, I read a lot of uh, of metaphysic um, uh, poets, uh, poets, <laughs> philosophers in particular, um, and that became a real interest for me. Um, and 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 uh, I think I think that poet, poet, poetry and and perhaps physics. Uh, are the two professions that uh, can't quite help themselves um, become philosophers as well in their in their, uh, in their you know, time? You know, it, they they both they both lead us to questions of philosophy. Um, a lot of even the most simple poems, if you I think if you dig deeply into them, there there's a Philosophical angle to them, and uh, yeah, I do. I do spend a lot of time meditating on uh, on these kind of questions um, and, and worrying about these kind of issues of of the, where am I in the in the centre of the of the big cosmos? Um, and, but but only as a as, only as the most amateur of philosophers. David. All right, uh, another poem. Uh, this one's definitely a change of pace, um, and this is this is a bit of a uh, a groupies um, poem for uh, Armageddon, if you like. Um, uh, a bit of a magpie uh, collection of of Armageddon's. <laughs> um, no end of endings. We've had at least five saviors knocking on our door. Show us your wounds, we shout. They form a little line. Angels with burning swords, a baker's dozen more. Demons raging in the darkness until Sarah changed the sign. It reads, no hawkers and no messengers from God. But there's no end of endings or the apparitions that they send. Rain of fire, meteor strikes. What can heaven send we haven't seen before? We leave sources of milk outside the door for the elves, but they're not taking them anymore. The end of days is taking longer than it should. I've seen a line of suns cross the horizon, a cracked moon, other signs. But Sarah calls it hedging my bets, as if I needed one sign more. What kind of numbers are required for a hoard? More than a dozen zombie neighbours, I'm guessing. We can't send any messengers or look up any definitions. There's no sign that Skynet is finished with our modem. We don't barricade the door. You can only catch the plague once, the saying goes. The washing line is bowed by birds of prey, harpies, and the three fates down one end. We play Revelation Bingo, but not Ragnarok quizzes, they end in arguments. After our sixth, fourth horsemen, we don't want more. The ice giants fight the killer robots who are draw. What's on the line after the fallout 
and the earthquakes. Businesses still send final notices for payment. They float on the rising flood up to my door. And every bloody thing or nothing is an apocalyptic sign. We've put little food aside too. There is no sign that home deliveries will restart. If any television drama did not end yet, it probably won't have time. Fenrir and Fenris scratch at the door, asking to go for a walk. Sarah would take them, but she's more tired today, wondering what it's all for. How should I send her flowers? The roses brown and shrivel down the line. Each tear should be death, each wrinkle and each line an omen. Sweeping out the volcanic ash today, I see no sign. Spraying for killer rodents and mutant cockroaches. Why send doomsday at us with alarums sturm und drang? The end shakes us every day. Blink and we'd miss it. I can't do more. When Sarah cries, the world ends. Heaven latches its door. We reverse each line we're given. Each day the world ends and nothing changes. Each sign, a new sign. We love as we can. No more dooms that life can send us, ravening through our open door. So you're an optimist then? Absolutely. <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wasn't surprised to find the cockroaches turn up in this one. Yeah. Um, so question, how do you play Revelation Bingo? Um, very hard. I, I, I'm not sure. I haven't worked out all the all the uh, the rules yet. Um, I might. I may finish it by the end of the universe. We'll see. <laughs> um, I mean, this is a lot of tongue in cheek stuff, isn't it? Um, yeah. There are whole industries of apocalypse. Uh, the 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 film industry loves it. Uh, you've got your dystopian sci-fi novels. Um, yeah. You've got you know endless interpretations of Nostradamus and the book of revelations and so on. Catastrophists, wherever you look. Um, so you're taking a pot shot of all these industries really in this book, in this, in this poem. Um, and you're taking a pot shot at yourself too, aren't you? You know, each day the world ends and nothing changes. Right. Right. Um, yeah, this is this is fan fiction, right? For for the end of the world, um, uh, you know, I, I I collect them as I said, a little bit like a, a little bit like a hobby. Um, but 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 you're right. Um, you know, there's been so many of those of those um, prophets that, are, that you know that uh, stand on the side of a cliff, you know, watching the dawn come up and say to their their followers, "Well, well, this is it, guys. This is the this is the last dawn," and uh, and then they're disappointed, you know, a few hours later when the, when the end doesn't come. Um, so there's a little bit of that that uh, you know we can keep on worrying about those those things that uh, that will end for us, um, and we can keep finding those signs of. Um, our impending doom, uh, or we can get on with things um, and, and I guess love a little bit better, live a little bit more wisely um, and, uh, you know, stop worrying about that collection of dooms that uh, keeps piling up in our inbox and uh, on Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, I... I, I um learnt later in life and i think i was in my 40s um that we spend 80 percent of our time worrying about things outside of our control and, and that we do better to worry about the things that we can control and not worry so much about the rest but it's hard it's human nature isn't it yep yep and we we stay up all night thinking about what we what that that silly thing we said to that person and how could we have said that better and then what's going to happen at, at work the next day and that doom never comes, um, you know. So we've we're wasting our energies on those things. Uh, I remember um, back in the seventies, in the seventies, or however long ago it was, there was a panic in Adelaide that there was, you know, Adelaide was going to be wiped away by a tidal wave, and uh, there was a day fixed for this to happen. And the Premier of South Australia at the time, Don Dunstan, went down to Glenelg to the foreshore to you know, tell everybody, look, it's okay. It's not going to happen. And of course it didn't happen. And there was a big party afterwards. 
Um, See, that's we, a poem, David. We do, we do this to ourselves, don't we? We do, we do this. Um, I'll have to write that one down. That's, uh, that's coming up yeah, in the next... Look, look that one up. And I also want to ask you, have you got any conspiracy theory poems? Um, not yet. Um, I, I have been... Um, I have been following not, not so much the, the conspiracy um, thing that seems to be rearing its head, but this this kind of sovereign citizen stuff. Um, I, I'm I'm re watching all the uh, the YouTube clips that that have um, have that going on. So um, you may see a, a sovereign citizen poem, but but conspiracy conspiracy theories are I reckon are going to be hard to write a poem about because um, you know what angle do you take it is if it's irony it's already so ironic in itself that uh, you know you've, you've got nowhere to go and if you're serious about it then uh, all you anyone's going to read is the irony so um uh you know i i do i do love the conspiracies but uh uh yeah not yet I'm on the poll all right, you have one more poem, and I'm sort of skipping on to poems because some of the poems have been quite long. You've got one more poem for us today. And this is a long poem too, so uh, uh, bear with me. Uh, this poem um, uh, won the Gwen Harwood Poetry Prize um, uh, on the day you launch. The future of the earth is a series of goodbyes, so you practice them in as many languages as you can. Ciao, sayonara. How do you know what you should forgive, what you should regret, what you will miss? Our vidazin, adieu, to you, and you, and you. This and this and this, things you've learnt to hold, tied to you with gentle strings, the umbilicus of memory. Give it time, the attenuations of distance the ruthless shear of moments accomplish any leave-taking. What must the last days of the Baiji dolphin have been like? You've never heard of it, but now you find it's gone forever. Pale and blind, lonely tag-end spirits of the Yangtze River, and a dam flushed over them long before you were born, or could regret them. Waiting in your hotel for takeoff clearance, old documentaries blinking at you in your room and the disoriented clicks of dolphins in your sleep. Say goodbye to them and dress. The world has moved on. The river's empty and you are leaving. Life was always adept at forgetting the dead. The future of the earth is a one-way journey, a series of endings, a solitary leap into space, loose cord unravelling behind you. Anything you ever cared about must be forsaken one day, if only because it cannot be held on to. You close your fingers, but it is gone. You should begin now. Cherish those things you must let go. Cape Canaveral gives you a blue sky for your leaving. Say goodbye. The rockets swept in plumes of condensation and the gantry sway and wave. Start with these, things are easiest to deny. Long after the river had been given over to algal blooms, fishermen would see those dolphins roll and dive. They could not abandon hope. They could not abandon themselves. Their childhood stories of solitary fins slipping through water. Leave yourself is hardest. Everything else can be survived. Now the world's poor tug at the barbed wires of the launch site and wish to join you. What wouldn't you part from here? Rising seas and stubble crops. Today you can leap into the uncertain ocean of space and are privileged to leave that old hegemony of Earth, the uncomfortable past. How do we bear it? How do we let each second stream away behind us like the spent ejector of a rocket pushed into the void? Because we must. Because we were made for leave-taking and for each severance, perhaps we are given something new, some brief gift. I am saying goodbye too. Did you know that? As you rehearse detachment, I watched the sky of contrails spearing into blue haze. I wonder at the ease of our partition. A lucky ballot 
and our seven languages say goodbye to things worth forgetting. The last thing anyone forgives is the past. Space is all departures and inertia. Set a thing in motion and it moves forever. This leaving pushes us away from each other and gravity does not hold. Things fail. The night to the universe is a long outward breath which does not repeat. You know that most of the universe is empty, so you have been saying goodbye, scrubbing out all that you can bear to leave. Each heartbeat is an ending, not a beginning. You do not send me a message. The other passengers tell you the trick is not to look back at the earth fading. Look forward, your spaceship dolphins outwards through the dark. So I'm, I'm tempted to just say goodbye, Damon. But, but I won't. It'll be one of those long-winded goodbyes. Um, there is so much going on in this poem, and I'm particularly interested in the emotional core that you've wrapped the poem in. Um, I mean, there's a lot of talk of the dolphins and, and the space and the rockets, but inside of all of that, there is, to me, a deep emotional core about the process of leave-taking and what it involves and you've got um uh severance forgiveness regret memory letting go unraveling grief the uncomfortable past and so much more um even if we don't look back if we only look forward we carry the weight of what's behind us with us is there, in your view, a corollary of lightness in leave-taking and looking forward? Lightness, as in slowly letting go of those things that are weights and, and, and dropping them away. Um, um, there's, a, there's a removal of consequence in, in letting things go. Um, there's a there's an opportunity to to uh, you use that word for uh, you know forgive yourself for what you what what you've done in the past. It's it's, it's um, a good opportunity to start again. Uh, all those all of those things um, generate a certain lightness uh, in someone. Um, I don't know that that's. I don't know that that's how I see the world. Um, mm. uh, I don't know whether that's in this poem. Um, there's a lot of baggage in this poem. I, it, I think it's, I think it's significant that I'm not the person in the poem that's leaving. Uh, I'm, I'm the person that that's staying behind mm. as the as the narrator. Um, uh, you know, watching that person get to go off into space and, and uh, have a future. Um, I think the, I think the underlying message there is that there is a future uh, for that, that narrator. Um, so it, it is. I think it's. I think it's the heaviness of of, of that. Um, you know that that leaving for that narrator is not. Uh, it's not a good thing. It's 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 the end of the world for that for that person. Right. Okay. So there lies all the emotional baggage that comes into the poem yep. but but you know you need to scrutinize the leave taking in some depth in order to bring to the surface all those emotional nuances don't you it um we, we talked before about things we we uh we don't often say and we worry about certainly you know if I have a fear, this is one of my big fears. It's it's the it's the leaving it of you know it, it's it's losing that that loved one that you know le them, them leaving or going away or not no longer being able to be to be to be reached. Um, that uh, that that generates that that emotion for me in this poem. You know. Um, um, you know, or, or whether it's some—it's a loved thing, or a loved memory, or or, or something 
from your past that you you would like to turn over again and again in your mind and, and think about you know it's it's that letting go um is is something that worries me it's it's a, it's a difficult thing uh, um, that's why this whole poem is about that that difficult uh, difficulty of saying goodbye and, and how you've got to say goodbye to so many things but that's what life is right and that's what the poem oh, is yeah we should be better at it shouldn't we damon because we it's a constant we're doing it all the time but we're not right Right. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, every second you're saying goodbye to that second, um, and you're moving on, and you have to. And you're not you're not scarred by that. Um, so um, we, we should be better at it. Um, but we we hold that umbilicus. Um, we connect to that uh, that spaceship, and we don't want to cut that cord. Mm. And now I'm going to cut you, <laughs> cut the cord of this podcast. Thanks so much, Damon, for sharing with us poems on the end of things. Um, I suppose that one day Poets Corner is going to end, but not any time soon. Uh, when this video is posted, it will include information on how to pre-order Damon's forthcoming book, which is wonderful. I've read it. So look out for that. Please check in again at the end of May when Poets Corner will feature the South Australian poet Rachel Mead on the theme of writing the parts, sensing the whole, the ecosystem beyond the window. We'll see you then.